Hello, and welcome to hashtag CR, CRA Arthritis at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association's annual scientific meeting. My name is Kelly Lenvoy. I'm VP of Communications and Public Affairs at Arthritis Consumer Experts. And I'm very pleased today to be joined with Dr. Janet Pope, who's the division head in rheumatology at St. Joseph's Health Center in Ontario. Welcome to our program, Dr. Pope. Great, uh, Kelly, and it's great to be back. It is. This is actually our, our seventh annual um, CRA arthritis uh, program. Um, it keeps getting bigger every year, and the opportunity to speak with experts like you is obviously a great benefit, not just to our organization, but our 50,000 plus members uh, across Canada. Um, one difference, obviously, this year, thanks to that whole pandemic that we're all getting very tired of, um, is that this year's is a virtual conference. And I do know that uh, the two big annual conferences in the world in arthritis, the um, American College of Rheumatology's conference and ULAR's conference last year were virtual. So you probably attended those. So you had some experience with that. Um, how's the experience been at the CRA meetings this week, virtually? Right, so better than expected. The platform's excellent. Um, but the reason I say better than expected because we all are one big dysfunctional sometimes, but happy family in rheumatology, <laughs> the allied health professionals, the patient voices, the trainees, the rheumatologists, the nurses, the whole bit. So I miss seeing the colleagues that are near and far. However, the chat's been really nice and some of the other gatherings and lobbies and things like that and networking places. The other thing that's actually really nice, and I noticed it a lot on the ACR and the CRA meeting, is things are, um, you can go back, they're recorded, so you can attend way more things before you could only choose one workshop, or if you ran behind at a poster, you couldn't look at other posters. So I'll tell you, the knowledge transfer is actually really good. Um, and that's and the platform's really good. But I, I we all long for some day when we can um, safely travel around the country. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right that we miss that uh, that personal contact and the benefit from networking that not just the um, the researchers and clinicians like yourselves, but when patients are attending those or patient organizations are attending, that face to face is really important, especially in a big country like Canada. We don't get to see a lot of these people. Um, as often as we would like. Um, but the power of that digital platform, as you said, makes it a much more efficient uh, experience. And I guess what we're probably looking at in the future is some sort of hybrid or combination, um, taking some of these benefits of online and applying them when we meet again in person. Um, I have to say to our audience that as one of the leaders in Canada, I'm not surprisingly, you are one of the most active people that attends these uh, annual scientific meetings. Um, you seem to be everywhere uh, moderating or presenting, and it's no different this year virtually. One of the things we wanted to talk to you about today is one particular workshop um, that you are uh, leading, and that was on scleroderma. And this is not a well-known form of inflammatory arthritis. In fact, um, rather than hundreds of thousands, it's only thousands of patients who are infected in Canada, but nevertheless, um, a disease that uh, uh, is, is often um, looked at carefully by researchers. We're still not sure about the cause. I think you'll talk to us about that. And we're certainly not any closer to a cure. And for those thousands that are affected, um, any research breakthroughs obviously are life changing and, and in some cases life savings. So I think to start off, um, I know there's two different types of broadly, two different types of scleroderma. Um, maybe you can just walk us briefly through those two. Yes, that's right. So first of all, it is rare. So many people haven't heard of it. So sclera, derma, tight skin, and it's 
most closely related to lupus, but lupus is about one in a thousand, and this is about two in 10,000. And when we talk about scleroderma, we talk about non-systemic, so morphia, linear scleroderma, generalized morphia, things like that, or systemic. And systemic scleroderma is called systemic sclerosis, and it can be limited, so some degree of skin involvement with organ involvement, but or diffuse, more skin involvement. And we, we divide the, the systemic up the two ways because the systemic group, different autoantibodies and different risk of organ involvement of internal organs are different in the two groups. And in general, as you would think with sort of common sense, the more that's on your skin, not always, but the more likely you'll have more internal organ involvement or more serious. So everybody pretty much has rain nodes, their fingers going white and blue in the cold. And that's common in people living with inflammatory arthritis, but in scleroderma, it's almost everyone. It's more than 95% of our patients. And it's often complicated. The blood flow is not just in spasm. It's actually scarred down or fibrosed and the blood vessels can obliterate so they can have finger ulcers or even gangrene or um, finger, severe finger infections or um, a bone infection. So that's a common feature, Raynaud's, that's far more severe in our patients. And then um, GI involvement, swallowing with acid reflux. A lot of people, again, a lot of Canadians have acid reflux. This is poor motility, poor, uh, poor contractions of the whole swallowing tube, and often the rest of the GI tract. So food sticking, need for dilatation, sometimes even need for surgery or very high doses of our proton pump inhibitors, interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, kidney involvement with severe kidney crisis from high blood pressure in these patients, not a common complication, but well known, and also uh, heart involvement. So really the whole gambit of many mm. of your organs, fortunately doesn't affect the brain, but you can have pain and brain fog and um, pain and suffering. So you can be tired and fatigued and have pain like other people living with arthritis. And of course it can give inflammatory arthritis. Um, like inflammatory types of inflammatory arthritis, um, is it correct to generalize that it affects women more than men? And in terms of when it does occur, is it around that period 25 to 55 years old? So that's a great question. So yes, women more than men. So similar to RA and RA trials and in our early RA catch cohort, it's often 80% women, 20% men, lupus, as you know, nine to one and scleroderma is about eight to two as well. So about 80% women, 20% men, maybe a bit less men on average. Um, and interestingly, uh, there's two peaks of systemic sclerosis, the scleroderma that's on the, um, can involve the organs. And one peak is kind of um, middle age, but I'll leave that open on what we all think middle age is. And the other peak is older. So the limited are often onsetting, the limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, onsetting a little bit older, maybe eight, 10, 15 years older than the diffuse. And the antibody profiles are different. So we, we don't really know is it genes, hormones, um, other things on the um, X chromosome that might be setting off more autoimmunity. And it's probably a whole orchestra at play for many of our arthritis patients that are have more in women than men. So a complex disease, I'm wondering what that might mean in terms of models of care, and especially maybe some of the early parts of a patient's journey, and that is getting an access to a diagnosis and getting um, an access to a specialist. So just as uh, so many of the listeners know, there's, there is quite a lonely road and a lot of questions at the beginning of really any of these chronic diseases in general. There's always a lag for most people. And because scleroderma is rare, um, the positive ANA or antibody test is helpful because usually someone along the way, their primary care or even a specialist like a general internist will do a blood test and go, oh, that's an unusual pattern. What, maybe I'll read about it or look into it further. But in general, you would think on such a 
potentially severe disease, you would think that, oh, there should be like a spot diagnosis. The person walks in the room and you see the tight face and the tight or puffy hands and some of the blood vessel changes to langectasia or red dots that can occur with the disease. But it is rare. It's really only two in 10,000. So most family docs have what, two, 3,000 patients in a great big family practice. So most will never have seen it. Their lecture in school was probably 10 minutes. I give the connective tissue disease lectures and we only spend a little bit of time on scleroderma um, at our institution. So it is, it's, it is a journey and often other specialists send to the rheumatologist and that access to care and care team um, it is really important that if someone's quite suffering with the condition that they should eventually be sent to an expert center. And the British uh, Rheumatology Society partnered with the patients. They have a very strong patient organization in the UK, similar to what we have here. Mm -hmm. And they made almost like a bill of rights saying that if a patient has serious complications, they should have the right to go to an expert center because that is when you're quite complex, the best place to get care. And that's, that's true for probably any disease. It's like if you're going to have um, a, a specialized problem, a specialized center is probably uh, going to have a team of, uh, you know, the most, the, the best practices and the team is always more than the physician. It's, um, it's the other specialists, it's the allied health professionals, like the therapist that can help in the home therapist and um, the nursing care and all that. So it, it is important, but you're right. There's a delay in diagnosis for the limited subset, often of about eight years. Wow. Um, we hear that also about, uh, I mean, that compares almost to ankylosing spondylitis yes, that we know yes. that's a bit better known about the challenges there. Certainly we are not as aware uh, as it relates to um, scleroderma. Janet, once, um, once that patient has been diagnosed and has a, a healthcare team around them, <clears throat> you mentioned care. Um, what are the medication and non-medication choices that uh, a scleroderma patient uh, will face? Right. So for non-medication, it's really important for education. If they read on the internet, they'll read that uh, as a, for instance, old data where their survival was in some situations not generalizable to all scleroderma patients, but rapidly progressive, very tight skin at the beginning. Some have 50% uh, five-year survival, which would only be if you got it at age 48, add five years, you're still pretty darn young. Survival is improving. So education about, you know, we're doing better probably because of standard of care, some uh, supportive treatments, better nutrition, probably all these other reasons why we're improving care and many people um, trying to struggle and uh, survive and then thrive with arthritis, same idea. Um, so education, also the, the therapists, the allied health professionals, um, you can become very tightened in your hands and just like it's already difficult if you have inflammatory arthritis. If you have tightness of the skin and all the tendons underneath, they can actually scar right down into your palms and things. So I think aggressive hand therapy, whether it's OT or PT, and because the therapists, if they're not at an expert center, um, might not be very familiar with scleroderma, I always say, tell the pay, I write it down for the patient, tell them you're like a burn victim with deep fascial scarring all over and then they'll go oh I saw that in my training I have to really you know use it or you'll lose it and I have to be kind of trying to get some of that tissue moving so I think that's really important when it comes to medication just like in lupus or just like in some of our other diseases we tend to treat the organs that are involved so three rules of thumb treat what's treatable treat whether it's mild moderate or severe and reassess, try to treat to some sort of target so that you can modify treatment along the way. So pretty much everyone has bad Raynaud's, pretty much everyone has a bad GI tract. So we go down our usual algorithms, but for immune suppression, it would be for um, inflammation on the lungs or bad skin involvement or inflammatory arthritis, things like that. And if they have pulmonary hypertension, we have to screen and then we send them really again in Ontario as a, for instance, and throughout most provinces, 
only an expert center can initiate the pulmonary arterial hypertension drugs because you have to have the right diagnosis. And then these drugs are a little bit tricky, very expensive, and are often combined over time. So again, the patient has a journey where they might be traveling far. Telemedicine has helped them a little bit during COVID uh, so they don't have to travel as much for their visits, but they still have to get regular testing. So there are sort of categories of how we treat and there's hope now. There's, there's more randomized controlled trials probably coming out in scleroderma the last five years than mechanical back pain. And we all will have mechanical back pain or we know someone that does. So, I mean, for rare disease, I can be very proud of the scleroderma community of doing many trials. Sometimes they're negative, but sometimes there's things sure. that are helpful. Um, well, that is, uh, that is a reason for optimism, I suppose, that it's exciting to hear that the amount of time and attention that has been spent is hopefully going to, to bear some results. Um, maybe that's a nice segue to um, asking you about some of the key takeaways from your presentation this week at the uh, annual meeting. Right, so I think the first takeaway is, um, which again applies to everybody listening, is um, as important we listen to the patient and their journey and their frustrations and try to help where we can. Always treat what's treatable. So, um, you know, I have some tricks that I've learned from patients and some, from some studies of helping fatigue and pain. And only recently, like only in my practice lifetime, did they recognize that pain was a big deal in scleroderma. Mm. And I think I recognize that on the first time I saw a patient with scleroderma, all sorts of pains, their ulcers, their arthritis, their contractures, their GI tract. Um, so, I mean, we have to listen. So that's always really important. Um, and I think giving hope where it's where hope is due, but being realistic. Um, I, I don't uh, sugarcoat things. If I'm worried about them, I tell them and I'll see them more often. I think another take home is when we're treating what's treatable is um, if people need help, if a patient needs help, we can network them. Um, we have very active Scleroderma Society of Canada and of Ontario. We have exactly what you know, Arthritis Society, ACE, Kappa, everything. And we also can buddy them. And because they do feel alone, sometimes it's a rare disease. So and I think the final take home for everybody is that it's not as hard as you think to reach out to get help. So uh, a patient has to make the leap. But for my, my colleagues, I would say at least once a week, not to exaggerate, but at least once a week, someone emails me about a problem patient with scleroderma. The patient's not the problem, the disease is. But, mm. you know, saying, I tried this, 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 what do you think? Or if they're in our province, do you want to see them or in our, uh, our community? Or or I tried this and this, I read about this, do you think that makes sense? So um, we really are a, um, a Canada is a big country, but we really do reach out to each other. And um, I think always someone's a bit shy to, oh, they don't want to bother someone else. But that that's how we all can do better for our patients. It does take a village. Yeah, listening seems to me a key word there. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk certainly in the last 10 years about patient reported outcomes um, and really a fancy way of saying, let's try to improve the level of discussion and conversation between the arthritis patient and their specialist, whether it's a rheumatologist or another member of their healthcare team. That seems to be even more critical when you're dealing with a complex disease like scleroderma. Um, well, thank you very much for taking time from the virtual conference, uh, Janet. We really appreciate you speaking to us today. We obviously look forward to speaking to you in the future. Um, I did notice that you're, you're climbing ever so steadily up the uh, trivia uh, game uh, <laughs> during the conference. So I, I wish you good luck uh, the rest of the conference um, with that and with your other meetings, of course. So thank you and our, to our listeners, there's gonna be many more interviews over the next few days um, at the conference. We ask you, encourage you to join us. And again, Janet, thank you very much for participating today. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. And the SPIN network, any patient with scleroderma can join that as well. And that's an internet network. Thank Great. you very much. Great. Thank you. And bye-bye, Kelly.